This is uh, Molly's sister, by the way. What's up, bodyweight warriors? Welcome back to another video, another episode of the bodyweight bulk number number six this time. Starting things off, sunrise walks. This is the thing, it's the first time I've seen the sun in like two weeks. Um, and it's back to being cloudy. So yeah, the UK. The noise you can hear in the background is Molly fighting with her sister, by the way. Anyway, this is going to be the last episode of the Bodyweight Bulk before Christmas. It's going to take a week off next week. Eat lots of food. Definitely the bulk will be continuing, as I'm sure many of us... As I'm sure many of us will be. As I mentioned in the last video, I want to again take just two seconds just to say thank you for all the comments on the last video, the one I made about the day of eating, talking about food, veganism, eating meat. Um, actually, there was a lot of constructive criticism and, and general good conversation in the comments. It wasn't like um, full of ideology so that was great so i pretty appreciate that thank you everyone who did join in today i'm just going to answer any questions that have been left on the series so far here is uh here's trouble uh. Oi, doggies. right so um there's actually not a whole load of questions and I'm gonna also share a lower body training session at the end of this video as well so stay around for that one because I want to chat a little bit about some weighted leg training goals that I do have in the coming year and it's kind of part of the series as well I'm gonna bulk the whole body I'm not just worried about upper body obviously you know we want to have some bigger biceps and stuff because it looks good and it's more relevant to our skills but the leg training is also nice. So first up, we're gonna tackle some training questions and probably one of the main questions that's been asked repeatedly is around the split that I've been using, which has been the push-pull legs. Because I have made videos in the past where I've maybe not said that I like push-pull legs that much. Um, and also I talked about it in relation to uh, the injury that I was still recovering from. So let's very simply talk about that one. So throughout this bulking series, I've basically been doing push-pull legs splitting that up and I've been doing one session per week. So three days of actual heavy strength training per week. And then alongside that, I've been doing three, maybe four sessions of one on hand which is about 45 to 60 minutes each time. So not a massive amount of training, training, maybe like six hours, maybe a little bit more each week. This is in contrast to when I was kind of the peak of one on hand training and I was doing strength training as well. And then I was probably training double that. I was probably doing like 12 to 15 hours a week of training. From a, a muscle mass perspective, it just kind of is simple. Um, if we are following kind of the evidence that I've shared in this video, so we the evidence suggests 10 sets per muscle group per week as a minimum, but that one session per week seems to be efficacious in terms of gaining muscle. So push pull legs once per week, that kind of takes that box off. By doing just one session of each per week and actually only having three strength sessions per week, that gives lots of recovery time. Recovery is one of the most important aspects of gaining muscle mass, especially when we're gonna be thinking that we're gonna take certain sets or quite a lot of the sets of the session closer to that point of failure. It's hard to do things to failure on a frequent basis without kind of pushing into that overreaching. So that's really been the main focus for the for the push pull legs, adding more volume per session, taking things to failure on those sessions and focusing a lot on having time for recovery between. Two from the injury recovery perspective, Again, it gives plenty of time for recovery, but there's still enough or sufficient stimulus during that week on the injured area. That's that's really kind of the end of it. Another option would have been kind of the, the upper lower split, which is pretty similar. I'm still doing some pulling and some pushing in both the respective push and pull sessions. So it's not completely, completely push pull, uh, but it's, it's most of the way there. The next sort of most common thing that was mentioned uh, was around building muscle mass, gaining weight, and then also developing skills. To be fair, I would just kind of recommend you go check out the training skills while hypertrophy video because I feel like everything's covered in that. A lot of those questions were maybe before that episode, uh, but it was repeated. So I kind of wanted to just reiterate it here. The only thing that I would add that I missed out from that video is the concept of functional versus non-functional hypertrophy. And I'm not necessarily a fan of the word functional because function is relevant to you, the individual. Gaining the most mass, mass possible is functional to a bodybuilder, but not necessarily functional to somebody else. 
when we're considering functional hypertrophy, we want to basically be gaining mass in ways that is relevant to help our overall goals. If our training is still revolving around doing things like handstand push-ups, one arm chin say that's our goal, but we're doing it in a way that's gonna build muscle mass, it technically is gonna build functional hypertrophy. We're working on stimulating muscle growth in a way that is relevant to the, the long-term goal, the skills goals. And especially if we focus on kind of what I mentioned in that vlog, which is training both ends of the spectrum. So training some higher intensity, some lower rep stuff with some more moderate rep kind of accessory work. That seems to be personally, from my experience and also with coaching, a nice way of combining the two together so we can gain muscle mass and gain weight in a way that is relevant and supports our overall goals. But ultimately, uh, it probably isn't gonna be helpful to chuck on 10, 20 kilos of muscle in a very short period of time, ultimately, because some of that's gonna be fat, uh, that's gonna inhibit goals. So really, I think the key of calisthenics is functional hypertrophy, so gaining size in a relevant way and uh, making that weight gain gradual rather than all of a sudden. Uh, probably worth noting as well that I'm really, I'm only gaining three kilos in the space of like three months. That's not a very big amount of weight gain. That's like 3% of my overall body weight. I'm going for 89 to 92 kilos. That isn't a massive change in comparison to maybe somebody who's getting 10 kilos uh, in a larger amount of time. Oh, and I, I just wanted to add to that, the first part of the question about the pushable legs. Somebody asked, like, basically they don't think they have enough time to gain muscle mass. And I'll just reiterate that like three times a week, 45 minutes to 60 minutes a session is a lot of time to do a lot of really good quality work when it comes to muscle mass and gaining strength in general. Most people overdo it. They do too much in the gym. We don't actually need that much. Uh, we just need to have enough to stimulate stuff and make sure then nutrition is on point. You're getting plenty of recovery in between and definitely good things will happen. The next one uh, was kind of discussing the undulating periodization that I mentioned on the uh, the training for mass gain purposes in which I talked about, you know, doing both high intensity stuff, lower rep sort of stuff, as well as the more moderate rep. And in there I mentioned about doing kind of like a month of one and a month of the other. And um, the question is basically just like, can, can that be longer? And the answer is yes, actually, I have been doing basically the same program for this mass gain for the past 12 weeks. I haven't really changed um, the program at all whatsoever. It's, it's essentially the same program. All I've done is applied a little bit of progressive overload during that time. So, so it was changed at about the six week mark just to a little bit harder, a little bit higher rep, uh, et cetera. But, but essentially it's been the same program throughout. Most people will do well with the same program for about eight weeks. If you're a beginner, if you have less training experience, you can milk the same program for much longer. If you've got more training experience, then likelihood is you need to change things up more frequently. Also, the case can certainly be made on a mass gain perspective that we need to change things up more frequently. The whole muscle confusion thing is, is somewhat true. Um, we need different varied stimulation to keep that muscle growth. Um, but this can be as simple as you maybe like altering tempos or adding extra weight uh, or changing rep schemes slightly. It doesn't need to be completely different exercise, completely different variation, all of that sort of stuff. For the most part, training is 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 pretty dull and just, just do the same thing do it over and over again but just make it slightly harder or do slightly more each time that's that's kind of training in a nutshell the uh, last question on the training front side of things is am i going to be testing my bench deadlift also i'm going to add in their squat um, and and that relevance of weighted movement see and see how i get on from calisthenics the answer is yes and going to talk a little bit more about that at the end of today's video in the, uh, the lower body training session. <laughs> right, just uh, a few random questions as well in between this and the nutrition stuff. Number one, where do I get the uh, woolen jumpers? Not that I've changed because I'm gonna go train, uh, but they are from a place or a company called PG Field. Uh, they're my favorite, I've got like four or five different colors and that's basically what i wear in winter because they're super warm super cozy and uh not particularly stylish but I, i'm a fan of how they look margo says is training vlogging your full-time job i know it always appears that all i do on these videos is like eat food and train and then film it but that's just because of i guess how i end up filming this and, and usually when i'm filming like vlog sort of videos i kind of set aside time to do that because it's very hard to do that and work at the same time whenever you film something it takes you two or three times as long as it would usually take to do the same thing uh, but essentially making videos is i would say 40 percent of my job um ultimately that's maybe a little bit less uh, the rest of it is dedicated to coaching 
to creating content for the app, for the programs that I make. And then also I do some property renovation stuff as well, which I've kind of shared in, in various videos and hopefully some exclusive videos on just that topic as well, because that's something else that I really love. So yeah, there's, uh, there's more to them what just ends up in these videos. And then finally, um, how's the golf game going? Well, thank you very much, uh, Blaine, for asking how my golf game is going. Um, it's, it's, it's okay, this is, this is how it's going. Not the worst, not the best, uh, but I'm pretty happy with it. And again, I don't necessarily <laughs> share this one because I know golf is uh, maybe somewhat Marmite, but something I enjoy. It means I get outside for a few hours. I don't check my phone. I don't worry about anything else. I'm just having fun with some friends. That's what it's all about. Right, so on to the training session. And uh, specifically, we're gonna be talking a little bit about weight training as the prior question in this episode alluded to. Starting off, as always, with some handstands, and I actually was joined today by editor James and his brother Tim, so we had a good session between the three of us. Always fun to train with people, uh, and, and it kind of makes you push yourself a little bit harder. And certainly, yeah, just, just more entertaining. But really, I wanted to talk about the kind of the lower body sort of side of things, because I've got back into doing some weighted work, and it's very much on the cards for 2022. So I'm gonna talk through the goals kind of when they come up. The first one being the Nordic curl, not necessarily a weighted movement, definitely a bodyweight one, but I would say kind of like the God tier of bodyweight leg exercises. Full Nordic curl, I would love to be able to get. Recently being able to get the full negative, it's the first time ever that this move has felt remotely close to being able to be done. So I'm just working on partial reps at the moment. So adjusting the range of motion to adjust the intensity. And I went over this in a fairly recent video, which I'll link down below if you want to understand more about that technique. I will certainly be sharing more in the new year when it comes to this particular movement. Then really we move on to the bread and butter, the squat. So actually in 2022, I've got a goal to be able to do a double bodyweight squat. So at the moment that would be 180 kilos. That's that's a reasonable squat. That's that's a four plater. It's a big boy squat. That's probably the most consistent period of lifting I've had in over five years now. I've dabbled here and there and never really made progress, but also never had the desire to. But I have really enjoyed the past three or four months of getting back into lifting again. To be honest with you, feeling like a beginner at something again is quite an enjoyable thing as well. Um, and I can feel the benefits just in terms of like my lower body, my, my midline also strength as well. Um, and so, you know, today's session I managed to work up to, not that I filmed it, uh, 102.5 kilos for five reps, which I'm pretty pleased with at my body weight, considering squatting has never been particularly strong for me, but certainly I'll be documenting a lot more of this, how I'm training it, why I'm training it, balancing it with body weight training coming into the future. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm excited for that one. It's a new challenge. Then just for just for this particular comment, on, right on the first episode of the Bodyweight Bulk Series, we don't talk about calves. Um, they're, they're, they're forsaken limbs, but ultimately calves do play an important role in squatting. Uh, not that you're gonna get any benefit really out of just doing calf training, like squatting. If you wanna get better at squatting, do more squats. But for somebody like myself who has weak calves, not flexible calves, but they're weak from kind of a lot of the flexibility work that I've done, strengthening that up will improve that force production, will improve the near extension ability through that plantar flexion. So uh, I'm just doing some calf work and as well, like having strong, powerful calves also makes you more athletic as well. This was followed up with just kind of the same old stuff as I've been through this whole workout beforehand. So just a little bit of a flexibility combination with some Romanian deadlifts, working on that hamstring flexibility, combined with some hanging leg raises, actively using that range of motion, and also improving a little bit of that abdominal stability. Then finally finishing up with uh, more flexibility work. Again, sticking to the basics, just some middle splits, just some front split holds. Uh, the middle splits I'm doing above my maximum effort, but I'm working on acting it actively holding it for a longer period of time. So I'm working about 80% of my max range, maybe laying the preparations for what might eventually become a Van Damme split. And then the front split, uh, one of my favorite drills, this overhead hold in front split, it really helps to activate that entire posterior chain. So kind of glutes, hamstrings, lower back to help drive the hip down further. You'll certainly see in the later sets how much that hip drive helps to go deeper and kind of take a little bit of that load off the front leg hamstring that can often feel like a limiting factor. But yeah, that's basically it, standard sort of stuff lift heavy at the beginning, a little bit of accessory work, finish with mobility. It's kind of how my sessions go, basically. Certainly there's gonna be more on this in the new year, so stay tuned for that one. So just to finish up this video with the kind of the last section of questions that were asked, kind of the things that I maybe I didn't touch on properly in the videos, and I'd like to 
touch on further. Um, very simply, first one, what is the app that I use for all the calorie tracking? I use MyFitnessPal, it's not the best one out there, it's not the worst one out there. I don't, again, track calories very often, it's only for the videos. It's a good one to try, but as I said, there, there are also better options. Max asks, my thoughts on alcohol, do I drink it at all? Um, generally speaking, I don't think alcohol is great based on the thing that I get with my aura ring, like looking at the, the stats. If I drink alcohol, my sleep is very, very disruptive. Now, maybe just myself personally, but I know there's a decent amount of evidence supporting that as well. But that being said, I've got a thing for the moment uh, when it comes to craft beer like IPAs, that sort of thing. I don't know why I haven't drunk that in a long time, but just lately, it seems to hit the spots. So I do drink probably only like once a week and it's gonna be like one or two beers, not very much at all. Uh, and that's certainly up probably the last six months to a year has been basically nothing. If you like drinking, not a problem. I just I don't really care for it. So just personal preference. Tasha asks, uh, what's your thoughts on creatine? Um, I think creatine is probably one of the best supplements to take in terms of efficacy, probably one of the well most well-studied uh, supplements. Certainly if you're vegan, vegetarian, you're gonna get much more benefit from creatine as opposed to if you eat meat, because about one kilo of meat is about the same as five grams of, it, it has about five grams of creatine in it. So if you're eating meat, the, the requirement is less, although you probably will still get a benefit from taking it. I personally don't take it just because I forget to take it and if you're not taking creatine consistently it can kind of mess with your water retention and then you kind of go through these cycles of like going in and out of it can affect that and uh yeah basically i forget so i don't take it but arguably i probably should teapot <laughs> asks what are your thoughts on meal replacements like fuel while bulking um yes is a convenient way to get into calories but calories aren't the only thing essentially fuel is a very processed food um I'm not a massive fan of that sort of stuff. That being said, I think whey protein is a pretty good substitute, a thing to add in if you maybe don't have time to cook meat or that sort of stuff. Um, I think whey protein can be used quite effectively without any issues at all, or another protein powder as well, depending on your dietary preference. But generally speaking, uh, I would try to eat real food. It's gonna be better for you. In the overall picture of things, if it's like you know 10% of your calories or something like that over the day, and it just helps you to bump things up, it's not gonna be the end of the world. Uh, I just would try not to rely on it. Lastly, on this line of questions, before we jump into a little bit to do, again, with the beef, the red meat, the environmental impacts, other things, uh, somebody asked to do with basically, can you only absorb 30 to 40 grams of protein per meal? And obviously I'm eating meals with like 100 grams of protein in. The answer very simply is no, your body's not dumb. It will absorb more than that. Uh, I kind of chatted about this in the simple bulking video that I did on eating. Uh, in there, there was a study talking about kind of Yes, maybe there is a benefit to splitting up your protein intake in over the day, about four meals, around 40 to 50 grams per serving. That has been shown to be good, but then he did mention in that that uh, a lot of this research is kind of based off whey protein, fast digesting stuff, and it's different when you have protein with other macronutrients such as fat uh, and, and things that slow down that digestion. Evolutionary, we'd, we would have come, we'd have hunted, we'd have eaten a lot of something in one time, we'd have fasted and then we'd have feasted and then we'd fasted. Your body's not just gonna digest 30 grams of protein and ignore the rest, that's not how it works. It just takes time for that for the digestion to happen. Certainly protein is slower digesting than some other things. Right, the final one um, is to do with beef and environmental impact because I'm gonna try and keep this one short and sweet because really like you could talk for a long, long period of time about this particular issue because a lot of the kind of information on it is that very condensed, short, bite-sized stuff like beef is bad for the environment, that's it. There's no more than that. Actually, when you delve into the evidence, the research around it, you'll find out that it's not necessarily the case. There's certainly more factors to consider than that. So very simply, I'm gonna give you a few just to consider and think about when it comes to eating red meat. We've already kind of covered off the one that red meat's not particularly bad for you. The evidence I presented last time, as well as numerous other pieces of evidence that is in the literature base. I feel like that one is, is, is pretty fair anyway. The environmental impact, however, is, is usually based off some Netflix propaganda. Let's be honest, if you're getting your environmental or dietary recommendations from Netflix, it's gonna be missing a few bits and pieces again because of how information is presented to make things easy to digest. We kind of ignore lots of different aspects of things to kind of present a nice, clear and simple message. How to present something is an important part of that, but the devil is in the detail. So when it comes to CO2 emissions, yes, there are gonna be CO2 emissions from eating 
livestock. But as I mentioned in the last video, it's actually a very small percentage of total emissions in most countries, specifically in the UK, which is where I live, where I eat meat from. Livestock emissions equate to about 5.7% of our total emissions. So a small impact from me not eating beef is not gonna make a huge difference. Even if we stopped eating uh, livestock in general, it's not gonna make a massive difference compared to other methods. Also something to consider, when we are grazing cattle on grass, which ultimately is actually the case with the majority of livestock in the UK, not necessarily the case in other countries, UK grasslands account for a net reduction of around nine megatons of CO2 per year, which actually brings down that 5.7% figure to around 3.7%. So it's actually reduced further by the fact that you have animals on pasture and potentially land that otherwise wouldn't be able to be used for farming. Number two is the type of emissions produced, not necessarily to do with CO2 because often that's made into equivalents. Obviously cows produce methane. Some people say that methane is actually worse for the environment than CO2, but something to consider is that methane has a life in the atmosphere of about 10 years versus CO2 has a life in the atmosphere of about 200 years. CO2 long-term is much more cumulative in terms of what we're producing is gonna stay there for a lot longer. Again, this is kind of a complex subject. I don't understand it fully, but I'll link to a paper by Oxford University, which kind of goes into this a little bit more. Two cows use a lot of water to produce various different things. Actually, this isn't the case, certainly in the UK. We have a lot of rain, um, actually about 85 to 90% of the water based in uh, beef, cattle production, milk production, comes from green water, comes from rainwater, pretty much all of it. Very, very small amount comes from uh, tap water. That kind of uh, myth is, isn't an issue. Maybe if you're getting beef from a desert, that might be more of an issue. The next thing is usually we don't have enough land to do grass-fed cattle, or um, we have to grow crops that we're deforesting to feed cattle. Again, maybe the case in America, not the case in the UK. In the UK, uh, the average livestock, not even grass, have each just average overall. About 70% of the diet of an average cow will be from grass. We have a lot of grass in the UK. Actually, around 65% of the, of the farmland in the UK is best suited to grassland rather than growing crops. So oftentimes, livestock take up the land that we couldn't use to grow crops, and then we grow crops on the rest of it. Usually, the efficiency of land use is pretty good. People aren't dumb, farmers aren't dumb. They're actually very, very smart. Out of the remaining 30%, 25% of that will come from byproducts of other crops, things like silage, um, things like rapeseed kernels are often used to feed cattle. So a lot of it actually comes from reusing waste from other industries. And only about 5% of the total feed for cattle in the UK comes from grains that are grown. And oftentimes, that grain doesn't meet the standards that are needed to be able to be used for human consumption and then the yen used for cows to eat. It's actually massively misrepresented. So um, yeah, there's some myths to spell for you. I'll link to many of the resources, studies, etc., that have been informed in presenting this information to you in the description down below. Obviously, I understand that beef isn't necessarily perfect, but ultimately we're gonna be producing some environmental impact by living, by existing on this planet. I don't think in a regenerative agriculture um, sort of space that beef is the biggest issue. Monocropping, producing highly processed food in factories, that is out of balance with our natural ecosystem. That's more of a threat to sustainable food production than regenerative agriculture. Uh, again, try to set ideology uh, biases aside and just use common sense, see how nature has uh, evolved and existed. I don't know, man. This is uh, this is a complicated subject. I'm not saying I'm completely right, but I just think I've just given you a handful of, of points that are commonly used by the vegan vegetarians or community that it just isn't true. It's just not true. <laughs> oh. Um, yeah. Thank you all for watching and as I said, participating in this series so far, leaving comments, leaving constructive criticism and just joining the conversation. I really do appreciate it. I read through every single comment and that's part of why I love producing videos. So if you do have anything that you wanna say, make sure you leave it in the comment section down below if you haven't already um, and continue the conversation because we need to talk about these things even if we believe or think differently. Provide some evidence, let's talk about it. Let's have a, let's have a, a rational, non-emotional discussion. If you just enjoyed this video, you want to hit that thumbs up button and support the channel. Right next to it is that subscribe button if you want to join the Bodyweight Warrior Tribe and don't miss out on any more future videos. But other than that, have a great Christmas, Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, whatever it is that you celebrate. I'll catch you in the new year and hopefully we can get stronger together. Uh, 
But yeah, until then, catch you next one. Have a strong week.